with the beard even. That was pretty good. Um, it's been a little while. You may recognize this. This is called an iPhone. You've probably seen them maybe in your own pocket, in your bag, maybe a different competitor, you know, a different brand. Um, these are amazing devices, but what I find most amazing out of these little guys is not the fact that you can do all kinds of dorky apps and things on it. It's the fact that we not even know how to use it in the first place. Um, the fact that we don't question putting our fingers on a piece of glass and little images moving behind it, and uh, we know that it's going to do something, run some application, run some process, we know what to expect. That's a pretty magical thing to actually have happen. Um, can we get stuff up there? I don't need to see myself. I'm standing here. Um, but it's questions like even understanding the fact that we know how to use an iPhone fascinates me. I mean, could you take an iPhone and throw it back 20 years, 40 years to the year, say, 1955? Would somebody know how to use an iPhone in that year? Maybe a little bit, but they would get lost. 1920, 1840. Well, then you just look at it and go, um, what is this? And what I really love about technology is the fact that we learn these concepts over time and how to use things. The slowly building of concepts, how to use technology. And that's partly what we're going to look at today. It's one of the questions that I just love um, when looking at the history of the button. And the history of the button is kind of a collection of side research that I love to do. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's fun. It's the history of technology. What designer does not love the history of technology? In fact, I would say even designers should know the history of technology to know why certain things mean the things that they mean. But my goal in the next 30 minutes is to convince you that the button is actually like the most important invention of the last century. It's not cars, it's not computers, um, blah, 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 blah. It's a little thing that we don't pay attention to, it's ubiquitous, but I think it's changed on how we actually interact with the world. So this story is going to be about like how buttons helped us evolve to the point where we know how to press a doorknob to the point where we can swipe our fingers on glass and have motion picture behind it. We know what to do. That's a huge leap in cognitive understanding in only about 100 years. It's been quite a century. You should be all, should be all proud of yourselves. Um, buttons changed how we perceive the world, how we perceive the world around us, um, how we interact, how we behave, and so on. Not all at once, but it was a slow transition. They actually helped change us how we think, which I find pretty, uh, pretty humbling and pretty awesome. So the way that we're going to go through this, um, I, kinda, I like to take this almost cultural view of it. See the things that we have put out into the world, kind of reflect back on. So we'll look at some products, we'll look at some movies, we'll look at some advertising, which is always the most fun thing to look at, um, and some actually, you know, web, stuff on the web. Not as fun as ads, but the web, it's like, there's buttons there too. And of course, we're going to get to that. When people, uh, people often ask me, what was the first button? If I, if I mention that I'm looking to the history of the button, they always ask, so what was the first button? Um, the way I kind of think about it, I would say the portable flashlight is act, was actually the very first button in everyday life. The one that people could actually own, take into their lives, and actually use on a semi-daily basis. Um, the portable flashlight actually cut down on house fires, because you wouldn't have to you know, ha have a candle at night and, and walk around and burn your house down. You could just use a flashlight. Um, interesting side note, this is 1898. The portable uh, batteries, the C batteries and D batteries, were invented at the exact same time as a flashlight. It was a single invention. Um, in other words, side note, a D battery is the exact same diameter as like a, ra a rake or a hoe. It's just one of those weird little standards that kind of happened over time. But the flashlight was, I would say, the first time we actually could use a bit of power, push button power, in daily lives, and only in 1898. But the way to look, kind of look at that point in time is to kind of think about what happened before it. So imagine an iPhone in the year 1860. And in that era, pretty much everything before electricity was, um, it was all about muscle, about leverage. We interacted with the world by pushing things, by pulling things, by shoving, by dragging, and so on. It was how we interacted with the world. It was the only way we could do it is with pure muscle. And of course, because we're clever monkeys, we also created levers. 
and wheels. And we got animals to do our work for us. Um, but it's all this mechanical motion is how we interacted with the world. And the thing with mechanical motion and levers and gears is you can actually see what's happening. So you can get a sense of, you know, if I were to pull this lever, it's going to turn this thing, that's going to turn, this piston's going to turn. You can see the action actually happen. So you can kind of visualize, you can understand what's happening in a machine because it's all visible and out in the open, assuming there's no case over it and so on. About the same time, there was other, some other really interesting inventions happening um, in that same era. The locomotive. And what the locomotive did, you know, much more than horses or carriages, it compressed this notion of time. It compressed um, a sense of dis cool. distance. Um, traveling across the United States wouldn't be months. It could be days. This massive compression of what it means um, to move across the country, move across distance. At the same time, the telegraph showed up in about the 1850s. And this was phenomenal because what it did, it completely abstracted the sense of distance. So you wouldn't have to send a letter via horse, you know, it would take one day or one week or one month to get somewhere. The distance of eight miles away versus 800 miles away meant nothing anymore because of electricity, because we're moving messages across electricity. It completely changed, it shrunk the world rapidly in a very short amount of time. And then there's buttons. Now what buttons did um, was they abstracted motion. And this is what I find completely, this is like a really in, huge point in, uh, in the history of human evolution. It abstracted motion. It also abstracted intent. So this is a device, um, there's 10 different buttons, and I have this at home. And I re completely remembered on the plane that I'd forgotten to bring my pile of goodies and, and doodads. Um, Ten different buttons. One could be ring a doorbell. Two could be um, start up some engine. Six could be turn a light on. So what happened was it completely divorced the idea of what you're doing from the result. The input was separated from the output. Things like the motion push had no relationship whatever to turning a light on. Whereas like in farm stuff and machinery, you know that pulling this lever, you can see the motion scale through the gears and whatnot. There was a direct corollary between a little motion into a lot of motion. In fact, that's pretty much the definition of a lever. Um, but now, the, the motion you put in has nothing to do with the action that comes out. And that's where things get pretty fascinating. This is about 1910. So at this point, buttons start to enter people's everyday lives. And one of the first places that actually happened was with cameras. So Kodak invented this you know, portable little camera in which you could you know, take pictures and you push a button. You wouldn't have to do the huge hang a sheet over your head and wait and the big flash goes off. It was no, photography was no longer um, a thing that only experts could do. Everyday people could actually take photos. And so what you would do is you would actually send your film into Kodak and they would send it back. But here's the interesting part. You press the button, and we do the rest. So very early on, the notion of a button was automatically associated with easy, with fast, with convenience. From day one, from a marketing standpoint, button meant easy. And this kind of travels all through the century. Doorbells, once electricity showed up, was actually wired to people's homes. You could run wires and actually ring a doorbell rather than you know, pulling a chain and then the chain link goes over a pulley, over pulley, over pulley and clanks some kind of bell um, and then the help answers the door, of course. Um, that's what I see on TV at least. Um, in the 30s, things get even more interesting. Radios showed up. Radios were the internet of that decade. Radios actually almost grew faster in popularity than the web did for us in 95, 6, 7. So this is the first time when people in a community could all hear the exact same thing going on that's happening somewhere else. It created this sense of community. You could hear the same opera happening. You could hear the same game happening. Um, it just it was a phenomenal thing to, to show up. But still, at this point in time, you had to dial in 
an exact frequency for the radio station you were looking for. In fact, you can see up here, they've got all kinds of different demarcations for where the, where the, where the cities were. You can dial here for Bordeaux, for Lisboa, for London, um, for Budapest, and, and so on. It was an exact place you had to go to on the dial. And of course, you're kind of fishing and you're trying to get it in. Um, and the marketers were always like taking advantage of that. Oh, your back hurts. What you need is push button tuning. So, in around 1937, 38, the invention happened where you could you push a button and automatically moves the dial to a specific spot um, in the spectrum. Um, it was actually physically moving the dial. It wasn't saving anything. It was moving it to a place you've saved before. Um, looks like even a dog can use it. It's that easy. Um, and just press the button. That's all touch tuning. Um, another fun side note about this one, this is a GE radio. And I work at GE now, and all the old GE advertising is just, it's beautiful. It's a century of beautiful, beautiful advertising. So these are called radio buttons. And please tell me there's somebody in the room who is having that aha moment of, oh, radio buttons. That's why they're called radio buttons. <laughs> Good, all right. My work is done. I can go home. They're called radio buttons because you can only choose one thing. It's the exact same thing. I don't know where checkboxes came from, but uh, <laughs> this is where radio buttons came from. And if you zoom in really close, you can see that somebody had actually saved on their own specific radio stations. And then I did the homework, and this is actually from Cincinnati. I could tell this radio was from Cincinnati, Ohio, in the US, just based on what's there. But what's kind of cool about this is was this the first concept of saving in technology? I mean, saving now is a ubiquitous thing for us. I think this is the first time we actually had the idea they could apply the concept of save into technology. So we're going to see like um, these different memes kind of kicking in. So once um, appliances kicked in, once radio kicked in, people started getting a sense of, oh, these are actually some really interesting times that we're starting to live in. The button becomes almost a metaphor for the future. So in 1939, there was a World's Fair in New York. And it's one of those places where if I could go back into a time machine, it'd be like probably one of the top three places I would choose to go back to the 1939 New York World's Fair because it was this complete ode to, oh my god, the future is going to be awesome and here's all these things. Um, even to the point where a massive tower of a cash register. I, I'm just picturing the workers actually making a cash register like that big. But it's a shrine to the button in a way. It's a shrine to technology. This is 1939, pretty much between, well, the Depression and World War II. So it was like a tiny little window of happiness um, between bad and, and more bad. And they would make videos. Here's what the future could look like. Your home could be like this. So this, this is a guy who's from Roy's Robot Repair. He's going to help this poor woman fix her robot. And the robot, it can do things like answer the phone, it can make the bed, it can fix the furnace, which is pretty damn impressive for a robot. Um, and it could scram. There's kind of some code in there. I don't know where, where the robot was, but scram. Um, but I just love the way that he describes how this robot works. There, miss. You see the heterodynes are feeding back into the stimulus reaction activators, causing non-snaps of the motor control resistor units. Oh, that's good. No, lady, that's bad. But your regenerative circuits are tuned asynchronously, and that causes concatenation in the intermediate amplifiers. Of course. Well, that's bad, isn't it? No, that's good. From now on, I don't think there'll be the slightest trouble with your robot. Your domestic problems are completely solved. Your domestic problems are completely solved. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> that's perfectly all right. And if there's anything else you want to know about your robot, don't hesitate to give us a ring. Good day. The future is about buttons. Um, and notice in there, there's a theme that kind of kicked off in that. All kinds of gender stuff going on. Um, oh. <laughs> You're going to see so, over and over in ads, it's so easy a woman could do it. I mean, it's just straight up bad gender whatever. Um, um, but speaking of gender, here's a twist. So this is 1943. It's, it's during World War II. Um, at least in the U.S., a lot of women were actually entering the workforce because the men were all, well, getting shot at. Um, and so here's a woman. She's actually lifting a tank using buttons, which is 
which is kind of like, kind of weird on its own, but she's asking, why can't we wash dishes by pushing a button? Um, and the whole ad is about, well, you will after the war, but right now we're fighting the war and buy war bonds and, and so on. Um, but she's lifting a tank, but she would really be rather washing the dishes. It's, it's kind of pathetic. Um, more stuff about the future. Um, in the 50s, Monsanto created this thing called the House of the Future. And it was this piece of plastic. It looks almost Buckminster Fuller-like, but it wasn't. And it was a, a demonstration of what the future could be um, in terms of like, you know, portable homes and whatnot. So she's pushing buttons and things are being activated and she's trying to get dinner ready and I love this way. Hmm, what should I cook? Um, and the vegetables are hiding behind the buttons and of course her daughter comes out because it's, you know, the mom and the daughter getting ready for dinner and so on. Um, what kind of, yeah. So I'm sitting here getting ideas for my home right now, by the way. Sorry, Sam. Um, so the whole notion of the buttons are the thing of the future, it starts creating this notion of luxury. If you could have things with buttons, it's like this is a luxurious thing, a luxurious life that you're living. For example, push button driving. Um, just push a button and change the gears. It's like this weird kind of you know, proto-automatic car. And also dig the gloved hand. It's very, very elegant. Um, so that's push button focusing. Photography. You, know, you no, longer, no longer have to focus. Uh, I mean, like a caveman, you could actually just you know, let the thing just uh, you know, do it on its own. Um, this is beautiful. Everyone thrills to hot points, wonderful push button cooking. Um, all you do is push a button. Again, this, it's this notion of it's about leisure, it's about luxury, it's about the future, it's about ease, it's about curing your domestic problems. This is art. This ad is a pure piece of art right here. Um, touch command. She is so in command of her laundry. I mean, just look at her, just the pose. <laughs> She just owns her laundry. Um, one touch of your finger gives you proper washing method for every known washable. I don't know how. So, but other products started kind of jumping in on this. So this is an ad for, for dye. Colored dye has nothing to do with buttons, but um, just change your colors as easily as you change your mind. Well, there's some code there. Um, just push a button on your washer and Rick Color will do the rest. There's no buttons on a block of dye, but they're kind of like, they're kind of feeding off of washing machines. Um, and this next one might be the most beautiful thing in the world. A push button meal for pork and beans. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, is like that heating up the can of beans? I don't know exactly what's going on here, but um, <laughs> it's just phenomenal how it became, uh, it, it's just code. I mean, the, the phrase push button meant easy. Um, and that kind of just carries over. And then, the most amazing invention of the century, of course. And here it is. Yeah. The greatest advance in television since color television itself. And sliced bread. The ultimate in performance and convenience. Ultimate. Seven function, remote control, color television so beautiful, it enhances any decor. Is that a hookah? I mean, what is but the outstanding feature of this great new color set, the one big feature that sets it apart, is an amazing new wireless wizard electronic remote control. The most amazing thing ever. And in a way, it kind of was. So this was the first device where you could actually control something else from a distance. There's no wires. There's no connection. You're controlling it from a distance. Um, and there's actually little hammers inside. It's actually banging hammers on a certain frequency, which the TV said it can pick up that frequency, and then, of course, then change the dial or the tint or the color as, as appropriate. Um, but the Space Commander, it just it revolutionized the world. It led to towards TV dinners and things like that. Another thread is the button starts becoming um, this notion of play. So it's not just about domestic leisure, not just about work, but also the notion of play. So in 1947, um, this is the first pinball machine that actually had buttons. Until then, all arcade games were usually um, kind of pachinko-ish, where you would send a ball up and it would bounce around and do stuff and it would kind of fall to the bottom and, you had, and that was it, you lost. 
Um, you could, of course, kind of sh you know, shove the machine and tilt it and things like that. But this is the first machine that introduced the notion of buttons to actually put the ball back into play. Um, the first kind of, in a way, interactive, you know, physical game. Of course, the flippers were all backwards in some way. It took them a couple of years to figure out the, the correct place to put the flippers. But hey, you know, it's all about iteration and being agile and something or other. Um, did anybody have one of these? All right, thank you, oldsters. Thank you very much. Um, shout out, shout out to the generation. Uh, this is Atari. And so this was pretty much the first time when you could actually have games in your home, in your living room, and you could play the most glorious things like Pong. Um, just the, the height of graphics, you know, Pong and Adventure and Pitfall. But um, this was in your living room. G you know, buds again coming into the home. And it would lead towards things, you know, games like Simon. What's interesting now is the button starts changing shape. So until up to this point, it was all about either rectangles or circles or squares. Um, buttons are always those shapes, quite frankly, because I think they're easy to manufacture that way. Um, but now they start kind of changing shape. They start evolving, but it's still the notion of play. Arcades showed up. Um, I probably lost hundreds of dollars and quarters um, during this decade playing things like Space Invaders and, and Tempest and whatnot. Um, but again, here we go, buttons. You could do things like you could fire at stuff. You could flap. You could flap with a button. Or you could put pepper on things. <laughs> a very versatile uh, little device. And of course, it led towards all the different consoles, all the home gaming systems, all the different varieties. Um, of course, PlayStation and Xbox would be the, the main one these days. Um, different variety of ways you can actually interact with things by using your, your fingers and your thumb. But up until this point, buttons have all been physical things you could actually touch. In 1984, the button became a metaphor. It went on screen. It no longer meant a thing that you could actually physically touch. And it kind of took, of course, twin inventions. One was, you know, this, this rectangle, this totally pixelated rectangle that was, you know, on this, this mini little TV type thing um, called a monitor, and of course a mouse. And the two things went together. And if you look back on it now, it seems kind of obvious what, how you would make these things go together. But at the time, it was a brand new thing for everybody involved. So much to the point where, uh, in 1984, Apple took out nearly the entire run of advertising in a Newsweek magazine. I've got it at home. I was supposed to bring it here. Go me. Um, there's like 20 pages that used to be advertising. But instead, what they did was they would put things like instructions. It was an instruction manual posing as advertising. Point click. So okay, picture this. You're flipping through Newsweek magazine. You know, here's a story about Reagan and Mondale in the presidential election. And you see this ad thing that tells you you move, the you move the pointer on the screen by moving the mouse on your desktop. When you get to the item you want to use, click once, and you've selected the item to work with. This is a completely arcane way to describe something that we do every single day without even thinking about it, but it had to be explained because it was brand new. This is from the Apple's um, uh, the Human Interface Guidelines, and they're describing what a button actually is. When the dialog box is complete, the user dismisses it by, in quotes, pushing a button. In the dialog, by clicking the mouse button while the screen pointer is with a button-shaped object within the dialog box. <laughs> True, accurate, but completely um, arcane for us 30 years later. It's only 30 years later. So then the button starts becoming a bit of anything when the web shows up. So this is like a very early web page. This is Yahoo from 1996. Now you notice the exact same concept is here, in which you are clicking on something and then something else happens. That's essentially what a button is. It triggers some, some other action to happen. But they're no longer rectangles. They're now words. And of course, it's early web. They're blue words underlined to hit you over the head that this is a link that you have to do something with. Um, yeah, they just completely, they, they just change their shape. They just lose the whole notion of, uh, they lose all the visual cues of what a button is, and instead you can do this. Now, of course, we don't call this a button, we call this a link. But it's the exact same concept of you take action on this chunk of thing, 
and something else happens. They're just named different now. So here's how much um, the whole notion of anything can become a button. So here's um, Amazon from about two days ago. How much do you think on here is actually a button? I mean, you know, it's not like a rectangle button, like it's actionable. Any kind of guess on percentages of how much on here is technically clickable, a button thing? I'm hearing hundreds, I'm hearing 99s. It's probably 99, 98. Basically, here you go. Spot the differences. Those are the only differences between clickable and not clickable. It's pretty minor. But, but the interesting thing is that we know that all these things are clickable. Everything here, we have a sense of a book cover. We, are, we have learned that that's something we could take action on. Random words. Look at all the words over here stacked on the left-hand side. We know that these things they can take action on, even if they're just gray and no underlines. Only because by their position on the page and the fact that they're stacked, we've been taught that those things are technically buttons. Ah, then touch shows up. Um, everywhere you know, around you know, in life. So in the metro, in the subway, touch screens to do things. In, uh, where are we? Yeah, in a store, you could check out. You could do your own groceries now. You can be the labor for the store. Go you. Um, but touch screens are in, are in stores. They're, they're ubiquitous. In cars, horrible idea. Um, but they're still in cars. Uh, how they pass the safety tests must be a crazy rigorous thing. And of course, the thing in our pockets, the iPhone. And this came out in two, 2007, only seven years ago. Um, and speaking of iPhone, just last week, you know, they announced iOS 8. And so there's kind of some key features in a combination, of, it started in 7, and they're expanding it in 8, to where the button actually starts meaning um, it's your identity. It's a security device. So it's not just the button equals security, it actually identifies you. Like only you can, can use this phone because you have to identify yourself and the way you do that is through the one physical button. The button also now becomes a notion of identity. Take it one level further, things like gesture. The button actually becomes you. You become the button. You become the trigger. Not touching something to become the trigger. You yourself become the trigger to make things happen. So, you've come back for more, Ian. This is yep. from the Connect Let's demo do it. in 09. <laughs> this should be good. Let's begin. You are the controller. The button goes away. But I you become you, the button. You can't recreate a finale like we've seen in this championship. She sets it up. You become the button. No, 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 don't kill my joke. There we go. Oh, God. No, 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 no. Well, let's pretend we were going to look at a Connect video that a woman was actually going to look at a mirror. And it's showing her what dresses she could wear. She walks up to it, and it puts her in a different outfit. And it, it reacts to her. It triggers for her. She never asks for the interaction. The interaction happens automatically because she approached it. Her presence triggered um, this mirror that would show her different outfits, and she could ask for different outfits. And it was this really cool minute-long video that I'm not going to fix right now because that would be really boring. But the joke was it reminded me of the Marx Brothers. Um, just this whole notion of playing with, uh, playing with a mirror. And awesome. Joke fell flat. Cool. All right. Something had to go wrong, but it was a good excuse to use the Marx Brothers. So what's happening is, if you look back at 1850s and prior, the way that we interacted with the world was we were adapting to the world. We were using our muscle energy, gears and levers, to actually maneuver the world. But what's starting to happen is it's starting to flip around, where the world is adapting to us. Um, the woman in the mirror is seeing different fashion options that she didn't even ask for, but is, the world is personalizing for her. Um, this is going to likely lead towards some weird kind of societal stuff. Not quite sure what's going to happen when 
the world, relaxed to, the world reacts to each one of us in a personalized way that neither one of us is seeing. Um, so there's my world versus your world versus your world. Things could get kind of weird from a social standpoint. Um, don't know where it's going to go, but it could be interesting in a slightly weird way. But the thing is, like, here's, here's the fascinating part. The next generation, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is a baby using an iPad. And kids get this technology. If you're parents, you've probably seen this happen, where kids get this technology fast. But, oh, this one's broken. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Her brain was taught that, basically a photograph, <laughs> yeah. Brain was taught that a photograph is something you can pinch, zoom, maneuver. But this one, this one sucks. It's totally broken. Um, but think about you know, the fact that you know, we know how to use technology to a certain point because you know, we, we were born at a certain year, and the technology of that year is just kind of automatic. Now, kids today, the world of touch is going to be automatic. The world of the world reacting to them is going to be automatic. Uh, the world 40 years from now is going to be kind of fascinating in some unknown way. The button becomes a concept at this point. It's no longer a physical thing. It's no longer even um, something that has lost shape on a screen. It's the notion of there are triggers out there in the world that you can't see. But you know, like if you walk through, say, a grocery store door, you might intuitively in 20 years know that, that is a trigger that something's going to happen. The button becomes just a pure concept. So we've gotten to, we've gotten to the point now where we think about objects no longer as static things that just sit there. Objects have a sense of depth and a sense of time to them. They're more than just the thing we, we kind of look at. We will be thinking about the world as a place that reacts to us, as a series of triggers that we are walking into and things happen, whether we like it or not. So therefore, that's why I'm thinking that the button is the most significant invention of the last century. And thank you. <laughs>